second webinar. Um, this is actually going to be a continuation of the one that we did last week, specifically on gut health. But realizing that not everybody that's attending this evening attended last week, we are going to do a little bit of a, a, a review. And actually, we have to because allergies and immune function or immune health in horses is directly tied in to gut health, as you'll see as we, as we go through the webinar. So what we are going to discuss, what we're not going to discuss actually, is a complete discussion of the horse's immune system. That is obviously just beyond the scope or capacity of a single presentation. So what we are going to do though, we're going to discuss the components of the immune system that are affected by nutrition and then also those components that are affected by intestinal health. And I think most people are now aware um, that in the horse in, in particular, 70% plus or minus of the horse's immune system is actually located in the intestine. And I'll have a few uh, illustrations uh, in, in this webinar that will help you get a clear understanding of uh, why we say that. So the first thing that we have to discuss when looking at immune function and gut health uh, in, as it relates to allergies and, uh, and immune function. Now, I guess sometimes I get a little bit ahead of myself. I think everybody understands that when we have a quote unquote allergic response, whether it's us personally, our dogs, our cats, our horses, et cetera, um, an allergic reaction is actually a very acute immune response. So when we're discussing allergies, in essence, what we are discussing is the immune system and immune responses to various stimuli. And the microbiome, in other words, all of the bacteria, fungi, protozoa, and even viruses that naturally occur in the horse's digestive tract that make up the microbiome play a very critical role in maintaining a normal immune function for the horse. And as we discussed last week, so a little bit of a pop quiz here for some of you, is that a healthy microbiome is a very diverse microbiome, meaning that we've got many, many different species of bacteria, different species of fungi, different species of protozoa, uh, different species of viruses, but, but obviously these are all beneficial uh, microorganisms. Obviously there's pathogenic viruses, as we're all dealing with right now, COVID-19, um, and you know there's pathogenic bacteria and so forth. Um, but what we, what we want to maintain are the natural and beneficial microorganisms within that microbiome. But when a horse is stressed for whatever reason, or he gets sick, runs a fever, et cetera, the, one of the very first things that happens is the microbiome loses diversity. And as diversity of the microbiome goes down, then that opens up the door for reduced immune function, or shall I say an unbalanced immune function. It predisposes the horse to insulin resistance. It predisposes the horse to systemic inflammation. Um, a, re a less diverse or simplified reduced microbiome really has a snowball rolling downhill effect on, on the overall health of the horse. So keeping the, the microbiome healthy and keeping it diverse is critical to maintain our wellness for our horses. So in diversity, um, what we mean by that though, another component of diversity is that all of these different microorganisms, all the different species of bacteria, it's a big community. And each one of these species of bacteria and protozoa and fungi and so forth, they all have their own little functions that, that they perform. Now, obviously, some particular species of bacteria are going to be performing very similar functions as others. But on the other hand, uh, some of these functions can be quite different. For example, we know that certain bacterial species in the process of fermentation produce gas. 
you know, it's gas production is a natural byproduct of fermentation. That gas is actually produced by the bacteria that are doing the fermenting. Now in the horse, excessive gas production, as you know, can actually lead to illness. It can create a, what we call a gaseous colic or sometimes referred to as a spasmodic colic. So in a balanced microbiome, you have some species of bacteria that are producing gas and you've got other species of bacteria that are actually then going to take that gas and they're going to utilize it, such as methane gas, for example. They're going to utilize that for their own purposes, for their own functions. So that's an example of all these different microorganisms working as a community, not only for the benefit of the microbiome, but in turn for the benefit of, of the horse. And if the microbiome becomes unbalanced and our gas producers far outnumber our gas utilizers, then gas can build up in, in, in the horse's digestive tract, and that can actually happen fairly quickly. Um, so that's, you know, just keep that in mind when we talk about a balanced microbiome, about how all these different species of microorganisms are going to be working together to maintain that, that not only the health of the microbiome itself, but the, the health and well-being of the horse. Now, also a review from last week, you'll remember that the majority of the bacteria in the horse's microbiome are anaerobic. And because they're anaerobic, we can't make probiotics out of them. If once they get outside of the horse, they only live a very short period of time. And so they don't lend themselves to a commercial uh, probiotic uh, product. However, we do know from research and clinical studies that really the most effective way to support the majority of the microorganisms or those anaerobic bacteria in the microbiome is with the use of prebiotics. And prebiotic is simply a compound which supports the growth and reproduction of the beneficial bacteria in the microbiome. Now, the composition of the microbiome um, can have some very significant and interesting effects. Not, and this is not only applicable to horses, this is applicable to other animals, including people. Your horse's microbiome can actually determine if your horse is going to be lean or obese. Um, there are horses out there that are very easy keepers. Um, you know, they face north in a headwind and they gain 10 pounds if they take an extra breath. You know, the type of horse I'm talking about. And, you know, a lot of people assume that as soon as you see a horse that is, you know, that predisposed to gaining weight, that they must be metabolic. They probably have insulin resistance, et cetera. Not all of them do. You can have a very easy keeping horse, one that tends towards obesity that is not insulin resistant at all. And, but what that will essentially tell us though, that that horse's microbiome is probably lending that horse to being a little bit on the obese side. Your horse's microbiome can affect his temperament. When a horse gets stressed, as we said, one of the first things that happens is the diversity of the microbiome goes down. And that is one effect that um, of a less diverse microbiome is some of these horses will have a shift in their temperament. A lot of them will become a little bit more hyperreactive than they were before. On the other hand, some may actually get more dull and less reactive than before. The same thing is uh, true in people. Uh, as we mentioned last week, uh, in, in England, they're using very specific probiotics uh, to treat depression uh, in, in certain individuals with, with a lot of success. Okay, um, The microbiome can actually affect what your horse prefers to eat or not eat. And we know that in people, um, you know, sometimes if somebody uh, eats a lot of, you know, processed carbohydrates, you know, white bread, et cetera, uh, sweets, cake, candy, crackers, whatever, um, that's going to shift the microbiome so that you're going to have an above average number of bacteria 
that are going to utilize that processed starch. And then if you try to go on a diet and you try to reduce the level of those soluble carbs in your diet, you start craving those carbs. And it's not because you've got a lack of willpower that you're craving those carbs. It's actually your microbiome cross-talking with your body saying, um, hey, guys, I'm starving here. You know, what we had cake last night. Where is it tonight? I want some. And the same thing holds true for your horse. I often hear a lot of times, oh, my horse has got a very picky appetite. Um, he won't eat this and he won't eat that. He'll only eat this. And the majority of the time now, not always. Okay. But the majority of the time, that's a good indication that your horse's microbiome is out of balance. Okay. Um, also your horse's microbiome can reduce susceptibility to pathogenic bacteria. As we talked about last week, we now have a very specific bacillus subtilis probiotic which can kill Clostridia, C. diff, for example. So that can be a tremendous benefit for our horses. And all of this wraps up with keep in mind, and this is important for how allergies interact with gut health, is that there is constant crosstalk between the microbiome and the immune cells in the intestine. And we're going to illustrate that here in just a little bit. So here's your take home message on your microbiome that I want you to remember. A balanced and diverse microbiome is critical for normal function of your horse's immune system. So if we feel like we've got abnormal immune function, one of the first things we have to do is make sure that our microbiome is healthy and diverse and balanced. Also, another take home I want you to remember, stress of any kind, whether it's physical, mental, metabolic, is going to reduce the diversity of your microbiome, your horse's microbiome, which is going to eventually lead to an unbalanced microbiome, which then in turn adversely affects Marvin. immune function. So trying to help your horses deal with stress is extremely important to maintaining well-being and maintaining a normal immune function. So let's look at the components of the intestinal immune system. Now, this slide, granted, is a bit busy. Um, I've got another one coming up which simplifies uh, what we're going to discuss in this one. So I don't expect everybody to uh, leave the webinar tonight and know exactly all the different components. But I think this is a good diagram, though, to illustrate just how involved your horse's intestine is in the immune system. So what we have diagrammed here, you can see my pointer. From this point to the left, you notice that says intestine. That indicates this is essentially small intestine. Over here to the right, this represents large intestine. And you'll notice there's a lot of similarities, but there are some differences. <laughs> First point, the small intestine is actually where a lot of your immune cells and immune function and crosstalk take place. It also takes place in the large intestine, but most of your immune function, immune system, is going to be found in the small intestine. Now, these individual little elliptical uh, figures here, those are the individual epithelial cells of the intestine. And if you remember from last week, in between each one of these individual cells is something called a tight junction. And so that'll be located right here between every single individual cell. So this represents your intestinal epithelial or the lining of your intestine. And that's same is true for the large intestine. This yellowish line represents a layer of mucus, something that we don't really talk about very much or consider. But this layer of mucus is a protective barrier between the lumen of the intestine or inside the intestine itself 
and the musculature or the tissue of the intestine. This helps prevent bacteria, large proteins, and other particles from making contact and penetrating through that small intestinal epithelium. Now, from research, we know that insulin-resistant horses, for example, have a much thinner mucus layer compared to normal horses. And this represents or goes right along, doesn't represent, that's not the adjective I was looking for, but that correlates would be a better way to word that, correlates with the fact that insulin-resistant horses have a lower diversity to their microbiome. And as a result, they're gonna have a reduced protective layer of mucus between their lumen and their intestines. So they're gonna be more susceptible to intestinal inflammation, more susceptible to immune dysfunction. Okay, now, next thing we wanna point out, these little blue stars represent dendritic cells, okay? These are interesting cells. They're messengers that essentially are going to detect any pathogenic bacteria, protein, something that tends to sneak through that intestine that doesn't belong. And these dendritic cells are going to come in contact with it and say, um, you don't belong here. So the next thing they do, they're simply kind of hall monitors, so to speak, back in school. So they're essentially then going to say to this T lymphocyte or T cell right here, um, we got somebody here that doesn't belong. Would you mind escorting him out or take care of him other ways? So that's what the T cells do. They can be referred to sometimes as killer cells because their function is search and destroy. Then the red lines are beta lymphocytes and they produce antibodies for any type of foreign protein or organism that happens to make its way into the intestine. Yeah. Now, interestingly, you'll notice a little section here called the Peyer's patch. What are you doing? You shouldn't be. Okay. This organ right. right here in the intestine essentially right. monitors the bacteria in the microbiome. Uh, now, how does it do that? It does that with this M cell, which is always associated with the Peyer's patch. That M cell's function is to essentially transport certain components from the intestinal lumen into the Peyer's patch. And then this is where you get that constant crosstalk between the microbiome and the immune system. Okay. You also have Panis cells down here. They're actually specialized epithelial cells, You're they now. also monitor um, the microbiome, but they specifically are going to prevent growth of pathogenic bacteria. So what I want you to walk away from this is the fact that you've got a very complex system in the intestine that can not only search and destroy things that don't belong there, but also this is where that constant crosstalk is taking place uh, between the intestinal epithelium and the microbiome itself. Now, if that intestine gets inflamed, the whole system starts to come apart. So this is a simpli simplified illustration of the immune system and how it works with the intestine. And I think for it, it simplifies, it makes it real easy to, to understand. Here's our house. This is what we want to protect. Okay, this is the inside of the body, inside the intestinal tissue. The fence represents the intestinal wall, and this burglar guy represents uh, invader cells that are trying to get through that fence and get into your house and cause damage. So our first line of defense consists of, I love this little bulldog, that, that's your killer cells, that's your search and destroy. So go no. ahead, buddy, jump that not fence and it. see what happens. That's essentially what, what's going to happen there. But now we do have a security system on the house. We've got neutrophils that are monitoring what's going on. We've got C3 cells that should they detect something that doesn't belong there, 
that thing starts turning around, you know, basically saying danger, danger, and we need to have to have something to take care of it. We've got microphages that float around here. That's your neighborhood watch. Neighbors are looking after neighbors and making sure the whole neighborhood is safe. Now, in a healthy, normal situation, this first line of defense in the intestine is going to take care of most challenges. If it doesn't, you've got a second line of defense, which are represented by these police officers. Those are your lymphocytes. So if something gets past that first line of defense, their job is to apprehend them, arrest them, and take care of them. And you'll notice that they're represented essentially by patrol officers in this case. And I'll explain why I wanted you to note that in a second. So now, what happens when we get leaky gut or intestinal inflammation? So those of you that were with us last week, you'll recognize this diagram. These are those individual epithelial cells in the intestine. These red lines represent the tight junctions that hold those cells together. If we get intestinal inflammation, the first thing that happens is those tight junctions start to come apart and now things can leak in between the epithelial cells and get into the blood and get into the intestinal mucosa. As that inflammation becomes more and more severe, these cells actually fall apart. And now we have yeah, an interstate point. between the lumen of the intestine straight into the bloodstream. And when this happens, this is what we term leaky gut. And that's when the immune system begins to be compromised and we get immune dysfunction, which is illustrated in this particular diagram. So now you'll notice that our tight junctions, our fence, have leaks in them, have holes in them. So now our burglars, our bad boys, can actually get through that fence and get into our yard. But now you'll notice something is going, something strange is going on here. Our first line of defense, our killer cell has turned into a puppy and our neighborhood watch is asleep. So, and that is a simplified way of putting it, but that is in essence what happens when you get severe intestinal inflammation and leaky gut. So, all of our bad guys and attack guys get past our first line of defense and our uh, patrol policemen get overwhelmed. So what do they do? They call in SWAT. So the SWAT team shows up and they get confused. They can't tell the difference between the homeowner and the bad guy. So they just start attacking everything. And that's why we have this poor fellow with a bullseye on his back with arrows sticking in it. Um, this is what essentially happens in, in an autoimmune response. Now, horses don't get autoimmune response the same way that people do, but it's similar. And so this diagram essentially illustrates what, what happens when you have severe intestinal inflammation and the immune system becomes hyperreactive and hyperreactive from the standpoint of sending in the SWAT team and they just start trying to eliminate anything that they can get a hold of. So let's use some real live examples to help illustrate this. As you can see, this is a very real allergy report. Um, this horse, uh, developed uh, very severe hives, and I'll show you a picture of them in a second, and you'll see just how severe the hives were. So anytime a horse breaks out in hives, okay, obviously that's an allergic reaction. So very valid next diagnostic step. Okay, let's do an allergy test and basically see what this horse is allergic to. Well, without going through the entire uh, antigens one by one, of all the only seen were negative. 55 antigens were either borderline positive or positive. 24 
were considered clinically relevant. So clinically relevant would essentially mean then that this horse is reacting to that antigen enough to where A, um, you need to try and avoid contact with that particular antigen, and B, we might want to try and treat that with allergy so shots or something along those lines. Now, you'll notice that two of the antigens, which are above that 175 mark, so they're considered to be clinically relative, um, okay, I've got a message that somebody's not on mute on their phone, so if you would make sure you're on mute, please, okay. I can't hear that, so hopefully you can. Whoops, well, there's the horse, but now let's go back to here. Notice this horse is in Texas, and he's clinically relevantly allergic to Bahia grass and Bermuda grass. That's what naturally grows where this horse is located in, in Texas, okay? Um, but now, the other thing I want you to notice is Highly positive is considered anything over 400. The number of antigens this horse was highly positive to is zero. So this is actually a classic example of what happens when we get intestinal inflammation, we get leaky gut, um, our neighborhood watch and our killer cells basically go on strike or go on vacation and the SWAT team comes in. The horse starts reacting to everything, even though it's technically not really allergic to all of these things. It's allergic because the immune system is on high alert. The immune system has become dysfunctional, okay? You'll also notice that molasses, oats, and rice were also high enough to be considered clinically relevant in terms of an allergy response. So I jumped ahead of myself a little bit, but here's a picture of the horse itself. And the horse, I mean, I feel miserable just looking at the horse. And, and the horse was miserable. In fact, um, this horse got so bad, as you can imagine, um, where the, you know, the owner couldn't ride this horse. And this was a horse that was actively being, being shown. So whenever a horse tests, quote unquote, allergic to multiple allergens without any highly significant positives, and that's the key point, without any highly significant positives, it's fairly safe to assume that the horse's immune system is simply overreacting. In other words, as we said, the SWAT team has arrived. So the immune system for most horses that present this way can be rebalanced. And we talk about an immune health program. I'll discuss that in, in, in just a minute. That's not to say, however, that we still don't want to treat this horse medically. Obviously, if I've got a horse with hives this bad, he's miserable. This horse needs relief, okay? So we can treat this horse medically with dexamethasone and histamines, or this is where you should work with your vet and your vet and you can come up with a, a treatment plan that fits the horse and fits your situation. So even though I'm essentially alluding to the fact that this horse isn't actually allergic to all of these things. He's just got an immune system that's become hyperreactive. I don't want to take away from the fact that this horse is still presenting with an allergic reaction. He's still miserable. And so we still need to treat him accordingly to try and make him as comfortable as possible and, and get him over that allergic reaction. Okay. So, this is, you know, our case study. Got a horse with severe allergies. Uh, the allergy test basically said, and, and I remember getting the phone call. The owner basically said, my horse is allergic to everything. You know, what am I supposed to do? So what we did was we switched this horse off of a high grain feed 
onto a high fiber, low starch feed. Okay. And we did that for the purpose of trying to uh, help rebalance the microbiome, try to reduce the acidity in the intestine. Okay. So then we also treated with probiotics in combination with prebiotics. Anytime we've got an allergic reaction, omega-3s, whether it's from flax or fish oil or a combination of the two, um, is usually a good idea to include into the diet. We can use a very specific form of vitamin E called gamma tocopherol. I think most people are aware of, you know, there's a lot of emphasis being placed on natural vitamin E's. And when they say natural vitamin E's, they're usually referring to D-alpha tocopherol. And wow. I guess I'll make a little side note here because it's, it's okay. important differentiation. If I've got a horse that let's say I suspect that he might be vitamin E deficient and I do a blood test to, uh, to test what his vitamin E status is and he does in fact come back low vitamin E. The best thing or the, the form of vitamin E that I can use that will raise blood vitamin E levels most effectively and the fastest is a liquid D-alpha tocopherol, okay? So if I've got a horse presenting with low blood vitamin E and I wanna try and get that vitamin E level up, I'm gonna use the alpha tocopherols. In this situation, I am more concerned about his immune response at the cellular level, in which case I'm going to use a gamma tocopherol. It's still a vitamin E, it's a natural vitamin E, but it's a slightly different form of vitamin E and it's gonna support cellular immunity better even than the alpha tocopherols. So a lot, some of you may not be familiar uh, with the gamma tocopherols. Um, they've only been actually available to be used in diets. So what time, probably the last six years because um, we simply didn't have a natural uh, source of them prior to that. I'm also going to include vitamin C. Now, the horse can make vitamin C on his own. However, if a horse is stressed, a horse that presents with allergies is stressed. Um, so when a horse is stressed, his vitamin C requirement goes up, but his innate vitamin C production goes down. So now, even though most horses can make an, enough vitamin C to meet their requirement. When we get into these special situations, we now have an individual horse that may not be able to make enough vitamin C to, to meet their requirement. So it's always a good idea at this point then to supplement with vitamin C, even though that's a, a vitamin we don't normally worry too much about uh, with horses. So we changed this horse's diet. We put, a, put this horse on this immune health program. And after 45 days, the highs went away, the allergy responses went away to the point where she discontinued the allergy shots and has not had to go back and use them since. So we guessed correct that this was a classic case of a, an immune system that had turned dysfunctional as a result of stress, as a result of intestinal inflammation and leaky gut. And so that's how the two fit together. So again, got a little bit ahead of myself. What causes the immune system to function abnormally? In one word, stress. Okay, and keep in mind, we often don't recognize sources of stress in our horse's daily routine or in our horse's life. Stress can be physical, it can be emotional. Um, when I say physical, I mean, it could be the horse is sick, he's running the temperature, he's colic, et cetera. Uh, emotional, he's, you know, you're, you're showing him hard, he's going from one show to the next. Um, another thing about physical stress especially right now, this time of year, 
is don't forget about heat stress. When a horse gets overheated, or let me back up and word it this way, what is one of the most effective ways that we have to kill bacteria? And the answer is we cook them. We heat them up, okay? So what is going to happen to the bacteria in your horse's microbiome when he gets heat stressed? And you can have a horse that's simply standing out in the pasture. Uh, for example, I'm, for those, I'm located in middle Georgia. Our heat, uh, uh, heat index, that's, <laughs> our actual temperature, let me word it this way, our actual temperature was 96 with high humidity. Our heat index was 104 here today. I got horses standing out in pasture, even though they're in shade, that are just sweating, just standing there, okay? This is heat stress. Um, doesn't ne necessarily have to be uh, environmental heat. When you ask a horse to work intensely, he produces a lot of body heat. And that heat essentially is going to reduce the number of bacteria in the microbiome. It's going to reduce the diversity of the microbiome. So even though you're thinking, well, my horse really isn't stressed, don't overlook the effect of heat stress can have on your horse. And this is why a lot of performance horses end up with intestinal inflammation and, then, and can possibly end up with a dysfunctional immune system. Also, stress is going to cause neural changes, hormonal changes, and chemical changes in the body, which can, can then trigger systemic inflammation. So you combine heat stress with systemic inflammation, that puts a double whammy on the microbiome, and that in turn then can lead to reduced diversity and immune dysfunction. So as stress reduces the thickness of that mucus barrier that we talked about, the number of foreign particles that can interact with the intestinal epithelial and actually make entrance into the intestine can go up and they can actually overwhelm that first line of defense. Okay, the stress actually reduces the activity of the primary immune cells. That's why your, your killer cells turn into puppies and your neighborhood watch goes to sleep. Okay, so the overall immune system becomes more reactive because now the SWAT team has to come in and take over. And that increases inflammation further and increases the histamine response or histamine production. So the net result is the horse becomes reactive to environmental particles, food particles that normally he would not react to. So he's not, he's not truly allergic to them, but he's reacting because his immune system is on high alert. So symptoms of an abnormal immune function, multiple allergies, poor skin and hair coat quality. They're more susceptible to skin infections, infections, uh, not only the highs, but summer sores, things like that. Increased susceptibility to parasites. Now that can be a two-way street. If I've got a horse that's got a high parasite infestation load, obviously that's going to cause intestinal inflammation. So making sure that you've got a good parasite control program is also important. But these horses are also going to be more susceptible to other illnesses such as EPM, for example, or influenza. Um, now, I don't want people to get too excited about this uh, because there's a lot of factors that come into play in relation to a horse's susceptibility to EPM. But we have taken several horses that have had recurrent cases of EPM where they've been treated for EPM two, three, four times. And we've put them on the immune health program, changed their diet, just like we did with that horse with the highs. And they have stayed EPM free after that. So that has been an indication that the reason that they've been susceptible to EPM is because of poor gut health and poor immune function. Okay. Now, not all EPM horses are going to respond that favorably, but if the, all of the little blocks fall into, into place, so to speak, we can help, help those horses out a lot. 
Now, you can have true allergies, okay? Just like some of us are truly allergic to certain things, some of our horses can also be truly allergic to certain antigens. And this is an example of an allergy report uh, from a horse that I believe, in fact, does have true allergies. Now, similar to our case study that we talked about earlier, you can see we've got lots of positives, okay? But we've also got a greater number of negatives in this horse than we did. Do you remember, okay, pop quiz, see if you were paying attention or you fell asleep. For the horse with the allergies in our previous case study, out of all of the antigens, similar numbers we have here that were tested, how many were negative? The answer was 16, okay? Start counting up the negatives on this one and you're gonna get a lot more than 16, okay? Another difference you'll see in this particular allergy report, notice ragweed, 1,681. So here we have a very strong antigen response to that particular uh, antigen. And I can, I can feel for this horse because I am also truly allergic to ragweed myself. Um, but we have ragweed, we have juniper, over 1,000, hazelnut, oh, 800, um, penicillium, almost 900, okay? So these are natural environmental antigens that this horse is coming in contact with, and he probably is truly allergic to these antigens. So this is a case where allergy shots and so forth um, would be valid uh, for this particular individual. Okay, so I think you can kind of see the difference, though, between an allergy report that comes back. You know, when I make the comment, this is classic intestinal inflammation or classic allergic response as a result of leaky gut or intestinal inflammation, you're not going to have any real high numbers. You're, the horse is going to be reacting to almost everything. And as a result, you can kind of figure out that the SWAT team has arrived, so to speak, and, and that's really the issue. So how do we help our horses maintain normal immune function? Okay, again, reduce stress as much as practical. Now, notice I didn't say as much as possible here. I said as much as practical. Um, I can't do anything about a heat index of well over 100. Um, if I'm showing... Uh, a horse. Um, that's part of his lifestyle. That's part of my lifestyle with that horse. That's part of my horse's lifestyle. So I have to understand, though, that if I'm actively showing and campaigning that horse, um, that adds stress. So again, we reduce stress as much as practical. We're going to utilize basic feeding and nutritional principles. Maintain a forage-based diet. Okay. Make sure the forage quality is good. Make sure your mineral intake and your vitamin intake is meeting requirements. But at the same time, make sure you're not doubling up. Um, I had a case two weeks ago where I had uh, an individual that was using a mineral vitamin supplement in combination with a ration balancer. And this individual was a perfectly honest misunderstanding, didn't actually realize that the ration balancer and the mineral vitamin supplement were basically the same thing, just positioned differently. So she was, you know, doubling up on all of those mineral vitamins to the point where some of those nutrients were actually excessive. And uh, then so... We, we created issues that way. So it was basically pick one or the other, not both. Um, only utilize a bag or a commercial feed if you need it to maintain your horse's body condition or performance level, or you're simply going to use a small amount to facilitate your horse's consuming your minerals and your vitamins. Um, if you don't need a commercial feed to maintain health and well-being, Okay, you don't necessarily have to feed one. Okay, 
a high fiber, low soluble carb type product in relation to gut health and maintaining normal immune function is going to be preferred. So my recommendations from the Triple Crown line or the Triple Crown Senior, the new Senior Gold, the stress-free forage, which is basically a forage-based nutraceutical is what stress-free forage is. Okay. So if your horse's stress level increases, okay, make sure, or first of all, Triple Crown feeds have probiotics and prebiotics in them. But if your horse's stress level increases above and beyond normal, it's not a bad idea to use supplemental probiotics and prebiotics. Provide anti-inflammatory activity for the intestine. You can do that with omega-3 fatty acids. Support tight junction health. As we talked about last week, we can do that with butyric acid added to the feed. Make sure your B vitamins are adequate in the feeding program. Increase antioxidants in the diet. Feed a gamma tocopherol. Feed supplemental vitamin C. Things like this. Okay. So your Triple Crown Gold line provide all of those features. Plus, they also have a particular ingredient that's going to help prevent gastric ulcers as well. The stress-free forage supplies additional nutraceuticals such as glutamine and carnitine, a high level of prebiotics to maintain a good balanced microbiome. So if you have a horse that presents with allergy symptoms, you might want to consider the immune health program, which is available from Stride Animal Health in combination with one of these triple crown products that we talked about. When I'm dealing with a horse that's got an immune dysfunction, I will almost always recommend the two in combination. Um, so we can go with Triple Crown Senior, we can use Stress-Free Forge, and we can use the Immune Health Program all in combination to try and get that immune system back to normal. So with that, I hope people have some questions now. I'm having trouble hearing folks, so I'm going to exit out of this. Okay. Um, go back here. Message. Is the stress-free forage the updated alpha locks? Yes. Um, thank you for asking that question. It is exactly the same product. Um, simply renamed and repackaged. So yes, Alphalox and Stress-Free Forge are exactly the same, okay? And I think it was renamed primarily because it's now going uh, nationwide, okay? Does anybody else have a question that we can type in here? I don't know why I can't hear anybody, okay? Thank you. Okay, what is the mo? Why does stress cause the problem? Let me see if I can attend each chat. Maybe that's where I need to be. Ah, okay, now I understand your question. Now that I can see the whole thing. Um, Cherie, you are absolutely correct. Um, cortisol, as you know, um, is the stress hormone. Cortisol, or ele shall I say elevated cortisol levels, um, is in a very powerful stimulator to open up those tight junctions in the intestine and also create intestinal inflammation. And along with that, um, stress also triggers neural responses in relation to hormonal uh, res responses such as elevated cortisol. Um, you know, we've all had experiences where, you know, we've been surprised or shocked um, for whatever reason. And, you know, you hear somebody say, boy, when I heard that news, it just hit me square in the gut. 
Well, yes, that's an expression, but it's also a real thing. Um, because sometimes we do, you know, have a sensation in our gut. And that is a re re uh, response of a neural message going from our brain, our emotions, right down our vagus nerve, which connects our brain with our gut. And that then in turn creates some chemical changes in the intestine. And if that is a prolonged type deal, um, so that emotional, psychological stress becomes somewhat chronic, then um, that also can create intestinal inflammation in addition to the hormonal response from the cortisol. Okay, let me go back up here. There we go. Names of... Doo -doo 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 -doo. Names of commercially available product sources with pro and prebiotics. Um, there are actually some good products on the market. Um, one is called ADR, another one from Stride Animal Health. Um, and the ADR does stand for Ain't Doing Right. That's where that name came from. That is a pro in, uh, in prebiotic. Um, full Bucket. Uh, is another one that incorporates pre and probiotics um, in, into their products, um, into their supplementals. Um, all the Triple Crown feeds have both probiotics and prebiotics in them. Um, so I would simply say when you're evaluating these digestive aids, the probiotics are easy to pick out. Um, the prebiotics, and I think this is another question, um, that was coming up, what, what are prebiotics and, you know, how, where do they come from and so forth. There are different classes of prebiotics. Uh, some of the more common ones used in equine diets are something called mannan oligosaccharides and another one is fructan oligosaccharides. Um, or inulin is another word for fructan um, oligosaccharides. Um, or MOS, uh, MOS standing for mannan oligosaccharides. Um, wheat bran, oat bran, uh, both of those have prebiotic activity. Um, beet pulp has a prebiotic activity. Not as strong as the oligosaccharides, for example, but those are some of the natural sources of, of prebiotics. Okay. With high levels of iron, do you recommend supplemental copper and zinc? Um, thank you for asking that question uh, because it underscores another nutritional principle that's important to keep in mind. And that nutritional principle is that your trace minerals need to be in balance. Your trace minerals in particular Iron, manganese, which you didn't include there, but iron, manganese, zinc, copper. They all have similar chemical characteristics, which means that they all can interfere with one another. So if I have, for example, your question was, if I have high iron, if I've got very high iron, that can interfere with zinc and copper absorption, okay, which then can possibly lead to what we re would refer to as a secondary zinc and copper deficiency. So in principle, um, if you've got high iron, yes, you need to make sure that you've got enough copper and zinc in the diet to balance those four trace minerals, iron, manganese, zinc, and copper, so that they're all absorbed adequately and your horse uh, gets an adequate amount of each one. Now, commercial feeds, commercial mineral and vitamin supplements have already balanced all of that out for you, okay? Even if you've got an, a, a little bit of an above average iron level, okay? They are going to balance those out so that you don't need to add additional copper and zinc specifically, okay? So 
instead of simply adding copper and zinc, simply make sure that your overall mineral program is adequate and balanced. Um, keep in mind also, everywhere is high in iron. Okay, There are some areas that we say, well, we've got more iron here than most people do. Everybody's got high iron. Also, horses evolved over thousands of years consuming more iron than what they require. Okay, And this is actually a topic for a whole nother webinar, which we might do. Um, but bottom line is just use a good product, whether it's a supplement or a feed, where those minerals are already balanced. And that's going to keep you out of trouble the majority of the time. Okay. Let me go on down here. What about natural supplements, marshmallow root, hind gut ulcers? Um, some of the herbals, uh, marshmallow root is one, slippery elm is another, um, that I will actually incorporate um, in, in certain situations um, and, and use them successfully. However, keep in mind that when we're dealing with natural botanicals, we sometimes lose control, so to speak, over how much of the active ingredient is actually there. And so if I, for example, if I've presented with a horse that I showed you in the webinar that's got hives that bad and the horse is absolutely miserable, I'm going to make sure one way or another that I'm going to uh, present that horse um, with some nutraceuticals slash nutrients slash dietary components that are going to get that microbiome back to normal, get that in intestinal epithelial back to normal, and get that horse some relief. Now, can you take everything that I talked about and presented and add marshmallow root, slippery elm, aloe, et cetera, um, spirulina, um, et cetera? Um, to the program, absolutely. Uh, it's not going to interfere. In fact, it will complement. So uh, no problem there. Okay. What kind of technology does Triple Crown use to ensure live probiotics make it to the cecum alive? Um, okay, I see where it's 8 o'clock, so I'll kind of hit this one kind of quick. You don't need any special technology to get um, bacteria back to the large intestine. As proof of that, I offer you this. Ileal enteritis, which is right in front of the large intestine, um, is more common than we used to think it is. That's caused by clostridia, okay? Um, that clostridia makes it through the stomach, makes it through the small intestine, makes it all the way back to the large intestine, okay, without any technological treatment whatsoever, okay? Um, so if you provide, well, let me back up. I got ahead of myself here. The current recommendation for probiotic dosing is you want at least 1 billion colony forming units. That's how we measure the live bacteria. 1 billion with a B uh, colony forming units of a probiotic to get effective dosing. By dosing that much of a specific probiotic, our, you know, the clinical data and university research then indicates that you're going to get an effective dose all the way through the system, small intestine and into the large intestine. Now, let me back you up a little bit. Where is most of the immune system located? It's in the small intestine. You've got an extremely active microbiome in the small intestine as well as the large intestine. And so you want your probiotics to be just as active, if not more so, in the small intestine as you do the large intestine. So when you're dosing a probiotic, okay, you want it to be active throughout the entire intestinal tract. Now, another little trick of the trade. Let's say, for example, 
I've got a horse, and I know I'm running over a little bit, but this is probably important for some folks. Let's say, for example, I've got a horse that has, is a chronic spasmodic colic case, um, gassing up all the time, or it's more susceptible than, than normal. That spasmodic colic or that type of colic is taking place in the large intestine. Okay, so your, your question and your concern are extremely valid here. So how do we then rebalance the microbiome in that large intestine? Okay, so now we're addressing your question, you know, straight on. We know that if we dose a bolus, in other words, a large amount of something, if we dose a bolus of anything, to a horse that's got a relatively empty stomach or said more correctly, the stomach is mostly liquid phase rather than solid phase. And I'll go come back to that in a second. So if I take a bolus of a pro probiotic paste or a probiotic product that I've simply dosed via syringe, um, a dewormer, a medication, doesn't matter what it is, if I take a bolus of something and put it all at once into a horse's stomach with a liquid phase, within 15 minutes, I'll be able to detect whatever I put into that stomach back in the cecum and the colon. Okay, It takes the express line straight on through. Um, now, what do, what, when does a horse have a liquid phase in the stomach? A horse has a liquid phase in the stomach either A, when he hasn't had anything to eat for a while, but we don't really want to do that to our horses because they are constant grazers, or their stomach is full primarily of forage. In other words, we haven't fed them any grain yet. So when we feed a horse a grain meal, that grain hits the stomach, starts absorbing, interacting with the fluids in the stomach. Now my liquid phase in the stomach goes down. So now if I take a bolus of something and put it into that stomach, now it's going to more gradually make its way through the stomach and through the small intestine and get back into the large intestine. So I've got a horse, spasmodic colic, chronic all the time. How do I want to dose my probiotics and my prebiotics so I can get them back to the large intestine in, in as great a concentration as possible? I simply orally dose it. I don't mix it in with the feed. I'm going to orally dose it before about 15, 20 minutes before I give that horse a grain meal. And that way I'll get the majority of those bugs back into the large intestine. Um, so it's, I see it's 8.06 and I've gone over. Um, so I want to thank everybody for attending. I hope I've been helpful uh, to some of you to understand how gut health and allergies interact with each other and maybe a few other points uh, as well. So everybody have a, a good evening and we'll try to do a few more of these. Uh, you can submit some you know, topics for future webinars to us and we'll try to get to those. So thank you very much.